Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 377, featuring part four of my interview with uh, Tim Lang. This part of the interview, he talks about his game Might and Magic 9, uh, which, uh, <laughs> you know, admittedly doesn't have the best uh, reputation uh, of the Might and Magic series. So we get into that, what was going on behind the scenes, uh, what actually worked out well in the game, and uh, what was uh, the reason for some of the problems that it had. We get into that. Uh, we also talk about some Easter eggs and the other Might and Magic games, and a lot of uh, really awesome and uh, fun behind-the-scenes stuff that was going on at New World Computing uh, during uh, the development of these games. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here. I know you'll enjoy it. So without further ado, here is Mr. Tim Lang. You know, I'm pretty sure I can remember that lava puzzle. <laughs> you know, it's I like the whole time you're telling that story, it's like some little tickling uh, brain cells. It was something, something caverns. Caverns. I know where yeah. it is. I can picture it in my, I can almost yeah. picture the solution, you know. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I, I don't remember what it was called now, but if I had a strategy guide, it'd be, oh, it was this one. <laughs> oh, but. Yeah, it's always so great to, to talk to what, uh, I like to, you know, level designers and talk, talking to them because you played the levels, you, you probably had no idea, like, anything about the person. You know, they yeah. created this. And then once you sort of meet them, or I guess people watching the show, <laughs> uh, next time they play it, they'll, they'll have a little personality to go with the, yeah. uh, the that, experience. I, that, that's, I love that. I always yeah. I always read the credits of, of games because I want to know, you know, the names of the people who who worked on it. And it's maybe it's a nerdy industry thing, but... I think everybody... I, I mean, if I were a game producer, I would... Like, when you enter the dungeon, a little thing would pop up and be like, this dungeon is by, <laughs> you know, so-and-so. <laughs> Tim Lang, you know? Yeah, that'd be great. Like, a little little room or something. And Yeah, because I don't, I don't think I, even I know which which level... Who created which levels in, in Might and Magic anymore. You ever stick your name in there somehow? <laughs> uh, the Surely. best... The best we did was was the the office dungeon. <laughs> is that the Easter egg dungeon? I had a the Easter egg dungeon. Some, some questions about this. What is this Easter egg dungeon business? I mean, that's <laughs> a little bit of a spoiler alert. <laughs> if you don't want to know about the Easter egg dungeon, skip it. <laughs> this part. But uh, what about the Easter egg dungeon? Whole dungeon. So, wow. The the Easter egg dungeon was. Uh, I don't even know whose idea it was. In the beginning, I know that it was my job to build it, <laughs> but um, basically, somebody it was like a it was a credits that wasn't credits, I guess. So, so I modeled the entire office, the entire New World office, and I did this for Might and Magic Six and Might and Magic Seven. And you'll see the difference of how the office grew and and stuff oh, between yeah. Might and Magic Six and Might and Magic that Seven. Is really meta. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then we put we put every Every person who worked at the company, basically at their desk. <laughs> so, um, with Might and Magic Six, you can go in and, and go into the little test lab and and find me in in there and and kill me. And I I'm not sure if <laughs> Might and Magic Seven if we had the disco lounge yet. <laughs> we had this office. Me and me and. Uh, um, Two other level designers, uh, Ken Spencer, who went on, he's he went on to work on work at Epic on the, the Gears of War stuff, and this other guy, Tony Evans, who's not he's done a lot of great stuff since then. Both of them have, but uh, they were moving the stuff around, and they put us in the old um, sound recording room. So it was you know padded walls and a, and a, like a vocal booth area, and then a engineering area and and we decided that that we were going to call it the disco lounge and i brought in a black light ken brought in a disco ball and and we put a flyer on the door that said five dollars entry and <laughs> and uh, i think to the to the end of new world that room was known as the disco lounge even after we moved out of it <laughs> So, but as as far as why we did the the um, company office as a dungeon, I don't I don't remember why. 
It must have, you know, the thought must have occurred to you. People might never find this thing, right? Oh, yeah, we knew. It was supposed to be an Easter egg. Oh. It was supposed to be hidden and, and something that that only the... the um... How long did it take people to find out about it? Yeah, well, I'm, I know that, that people have talked about it before. I, I, I'm sure I've seen it on forums. But, yeah, it was supposed to be for for the, the hardcore of the hardcore gamers. I think that at the end of the dungeon, you got the Super Goober Prize. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was what, what you got for finding it, was, was you were a Super Goober. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, one of the things I loved about those games. You could just be, for whatever reason, like, I'm going to fly up to this little alcove up here and feel like yeah. I had discovered something that nobody else... Like I wasn't supposed yeah. to find this, or this was a. Uh, we always like to re- uh, yeah, to report the the explorers because that's you know there's, um, I think it was Ernest Adams who who talked about the four types of players, like there's just the battler, there's the explorer, there's a, I don't remember the other two, but but as a designer you want to cater each one of your your designs to a different sort of one of those four archetypes of, of, uh, of characters. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the Explorer was definitely one we, we like to reward. And I wish I had a little anecdote of, of something that we'd, we'd hidden, but, but, uh, I, I don't offhand. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I remember this going into some room one time and there's this big guy in a suit. And I thought, Whoa, this is not a monster. This is a guy in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> Just totally. I was just a kid, you know. Just went right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like but like. It's still uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, what was the thinking behind the move in, from six to seven from those uh, sort of actors, like photographed uh, characters, to the CGI uh, characters, um, character portraits? I guess I should say. I, you know, it's funny because the uh, some of those were real people. Yeah. And that's that's probably another little Easter egg. Like, uh, you know, Sir Christian was uh, um, Chris uh, Chris Vanover, and then there was Sir Mullick, and and I showed up in it. We got we got this call actually of uh, an email sent out to to the company that said, "Hey, uh, we're taking pictures on Tuesday or whatever day. Uh, if you have any Renaissance Fair outfits." <laughs> Come on down and and get your picture taken. I was like, well, I got a Renaissance Fair outfit. I'm gonna I'm gonna come down. I had chainmail, and and so I I put on all my stuff and my chainmail and my sword and and uh, I think they made me Woodrow, the uh, the armorer, in uh, uh, I can't remember the, the one in the castle. I think it was yeah, very early on in the game, but I'm in there, um, and a lot of the other employees are. But I'm not sure. I th- I'm well. I can guess why they wanted to move from from uh, the photographs to CGI. Is that it's it's easier to to manipulate. Yeah. You know, so if if suddenly you think, oh, you know, we've got we need this new reaction, this poisoned reaction or whatever. Now you got to go find the person, put them in their suit, poison them. Yeah, yeah, make them make the face. <laughs> Then take that into Photoshop and and make them look green and you know yeah. so but with with three D Studio Max or whatever then then it's a lot easier just oh well I'll just whip up whip up a new model or whatever. I gotta admit there's a bit of charm. I always thought it was kind of charming that they had the actors or <laughs> staff. Yeah, it, you know it's funny. Yeah. I know some people didn't like it, but to me it, it was. I do remember that that they had somebody had gotten a CD of like ten thousand faces. <laughs> like this is going in the game, yeah. and, and so those are like like the generic uh, trainers and and house occupants and stuff. Those were those were all the. The, the from the ten thousand generic faces, but all, a lot of the character portraits and and the trainers and armors and and all of all of in Might Magic Six, all of the the um, nobles that you had to go and, and do quests for, mm-hmm. all of those were employees who they stood there and thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs down. <laughs> and, you know, I always th- and that was a real cool thing that I always thought about about New World was they always thought that way. They always thought that, uh, you know, how can, 
we need this. Well, let's see if we can get some some employees to do it. Get them into a game in a different way. You know, one one neat. I, it's a neat for me story. Is uh, on Might and Magic Nine when it came time to record all the dialogue. You know, I wrote all this dialogue and and we went down to to Rob's studio in in Pasadena and and I was there directing the audio, the voice actors and stuff and. And, you know, people came and go, and, and I knew one of them from a long way back, which was very weird. <laughs> but uh, all of a sudden, Rob says, hey, Tim, get in the booth. <laughs> what? Get in the booth. You're going to you're gonna do some voices. Okay. <laughs> so I got in the booth, and, and I did a couple NPC lines and, and some trainers and, and things. And, and then a few years later, after the game comes out, somebody had taken all the voice actors names and put them on imdb so um and i i I had completely forgotten about that and we i was talking to somebody about um the six degrees of kevin bacon yeah (laughs) and and i've got a friend who was a, a child actor so we were talking about you know how many degrees separated from kevin bacon he is now this isn't the uh stone keep guy is it uh no no the this is uh this particular guy is his name's Corky Pigeon. He was uh, he was on Silver Spins. So we were talking talking about how many degrees away from Kevin Bacon he is, and then say, okay, so he's three, so that makes us four. And and uh, there's a website called um, <laughs> Degrees of Bacon or something where you yeah. can go type in an actor's name and it'll it does the math for you. So on a whim, I typed in my name, and I was like, huh. <laughs> I'm on there. <laughs> How many got, degrees from Bacon are you? I, I have three degrees from Kevin Whoa. Bacon. <laughs> and, and at the time, I was like, that's weird. There's an actor with my name, and I clicked on it. And <laughs> my me. magic guy. <laughs> hey, that's really me. <laughs> and so that's kind of a neat little little thing that, that not a lot of people have. Is, is a, a fun, and, you know, people, people sometimes treat me like, like a star when they hear about stuff like that or, or you know i did a um which i find is weird because i'm a normal guy but i did uh i did a panel at at efron i think i talked about this at, at 3 a.m gaming um there was a panel on how to get in the game industry mm-hmm. and and people came up to me afterwards and i distinctly remember uh, a girl with with uh, the the Open. She had a magazine opened up to an article I had written on on how to get into the game industry, and she looked at me like I was Paul McCartney. <laughs> like, like I just see the stars in her eyes. Like, oh, wow. you, and and I just, I being a musician, I you know I'm used to people kind of coming up and saying, hey, will you sign this or whatever, and and you know it's like a little like, oh, cool, yeah, whatever. But but the the adulation, I was like, oh, how what. No, <laughs> no, I'm just a normal dude, you know, I do normal things, I just happen to, happen to make games, you know, <laughs> although I do admit that, that sound like I a start, humble guy, <laughs> when I started at New World, I was a little bit starstruck about John, yeah. <laughs> and, and it, I think it may have affected our, our relationship early on, that, that I just, I was so intimidated by this guy who had, you know, he'd made these great games all by himself and, and built this company. And, and uh, I just could only imagine what it would have been if it would have been Brian Fargo instead of John. Because, you know, when I was a kid, I knew <laughs> I knew who Brian Fargo was. I didn't, you know, I didn't know who made Might and Magic. But still, I was like, oh, that's, that's him. That's, you know. Fortunately, John is also a very down-to-earth, humble sort of guy, so... Yeah, I, I uh, remember talking. To, I think it was Glenn Wick, Wickman, one of the road mm-hmm. developers, and I think he was at Z, Zynga or someplace like that. And he was like saying that all of the sort of younger d- developers had no idea who he was or what Rogue was. <laughs> I thought that's so sad. Oh, you know? that is sad. That is sad. Uh, let's see. So let's uh, talk. On, we've already talked a bit about uh, Might and Magic Nine, uh, but mm-hmm. I wanted to get a little bit more into this sort of history of it and uh, i thought i heard you say something about i uh, withdrew that it was meant to be a ps2 game or that was uh, thinking at the time or 
were well, there two separate games or what yes was... and no. There were it was actually was was two separate games initially. Um, so the first idea was that my Magic Nine was going to be PS2. They were gonna when I got on the project, um, it was a they were like we're making a PlayStation game. And so we, we, you know, we started talking about different ideas and, and uh, came up with, with a, a particular story about um, Mendoza. That's where the original story took place, which uh, it was completely referenced in the current, in actual Might Magic 9. Um, but there was a whole, whole story about it, which actually turned out good because it gave me a new, a whole backstory in the future. But... So we were working on this PlayStation 2 game, and then we got a, a word from 3DO. They said, we want you to also, also make a PC game. <laughs> and and so that PC game was going to be the sequel to Might and Magic 9, and the PlayStation game was going to be sort of a standalone All right. standalone game. That also took place in the same same universe, but it's still going to be called Might and Magic Nine. So yeah, well, it's going to be. It was, I don't remember what if they were going to call the PlayStation One Might and Magic Nine or just Might and Magic something else. And uh, so I was like, oh well, now I've got to make two games. I'm up to this task. <laughs> and so I wrote a double, whole double your pay, of course, right? Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> so so I wrote a whole new story and. And uh, you know, whole new characters and all that, and and then uh, the PlayStation game got canceled. Why did they cancel that one? You think that would have been the one? It, well, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't very far along. Oh, okay. And and there was we didn't have the resources to staff two full teams to make both those games at the same time, particularly with only one lead designer. <laughs> so so we talked for a long time. Uh, Keith and I, the, the director, and we said, okay, so we've we've got this steam on this PC game. There's already levels built, and let's just make that the Might Magic Nine, and then we'll save this other all this other work that you've done for something in the future. And all that other work eventually, when we finished Might Magic Nine, was ending up to be the framework for what I'd had in mind for Might Magic Ten, which never. New World never put out. I don't know if they called the 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 new Might and Magic. They called that Might and Magic Ten, right? Ten Legacy, I think. So. Yeah, well, yeah. It's uh, that. It, that has it, nothing to do with the the one that you were. You no, know, yeah, nothing to do at all. Um, in fact, a lot of people had misconstrued on on the message boards and stuff that that I was writing a Might and Magic novel <laughs> that was based on Might and Magic Ten, and and that wasn't the case at all. Um, but it was a good story. It was a great story, and and I've still got it in the back of my head. Maybe you should write that the, thing. There's uh, wizardry novels, and uh... that it it would kind of be neat, actually, because um, I really I, I thought it was a great story, and and it picked up uh, picked up where Nikolai left off, Nikolai Ironfit. Yeah, and because I for some reason I always loved that character. And, and so the story was basically about him, and uh, yeah, that was the end. They 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 canceled it, and and that was it. It was over. <laughs> That's surprising. Uh, what were your thoughts on this uh, Lithtech engine that you were using? Was that a good engine, or, or what was it? The... You know, it's kind of hard to to. To be entirely critical of the LithTech engine, um, because it, it, there was a lot of great games that was that were was made for it. You know, um, there was some giant robot fighting game name I can't remember. Uh, no one lives forever. Yeah. Great first person shooter. Puzzle, uh, Everybody uh, loves that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and but uh, you know, LithTech was initially Tron, the the Tron game that came out around 1999, 2000. Uh, but the it was a very good, inexpensive. <laughs> that was another thing compared to compared to um, Unreal at the time, or or uh, can't remember what the other engine that we were looking at was. 
was. But uh, it was like a, a tenth of the price of, of Unreal at the time. Like Unreal was, I I want to say, a license for Unreal was like a million dollars. Wow. And Lift Tech was like a hundred thousand. And you compare them, and and comparably, Unreal was better, but Lift Tech was still very good. Uh, the problem with it was that it was a very good first-person shooter engine. And and for a role-playing game, it wasn't quite what we wanted. And one thing that, that John taught me about developing games is you always... You have to design to the technology. A lot of people try to do to, to force the technology yeah. based on the design, but but that's how you end up not putting a game out. You know, if you when you have to if you have the limitations of the engine, you have to design around it. And when we had started working with Lift Tech, we were working on a game called Legend of Might and Magic, yeah. which was supposed to be a well, they called it RPG Light. But what that basically meant was sort of a new worldy take on Diablo. So it was a first person RPG with a limited number of stats, but you could buddy up with three of your other friends and go on adventures together. But the prob the biggest problem that Lift Tech faced with with Legends was that the the networking code couldn't handle uh, players being in different. Like, I think they called them rooms, but they were basically different levels. Yeah. So if if one player was at a bar, was at the at the shop, and everybody else wanted to go to the dungeon, they all had to go to the dungeon together. And that ultimately spelled the end of uh, Legends of Might and Magic as a role playing game. And then that ended up being a, a Counter-Strike sort of fantasy Counter-Strike game. Um, but we, we had thought that, that it was going to be just fine for, for Might and Magic 9, which, I mean, it, it turned out okay. And I think that if we had, with the exception of the Fly spell, if we'd had um, more resources and more time, we probably could have put out a, a really, really top-notch, top-notch game. Um, one thing that I'll, I hear a lot of people uh, complain about, particularly with Lift Tech and Might and Magic 9, was that Might and Magic 9 was an ugly, ugly game. Like you look at the 3D models, and, and they're just ugly. Which which is actually kind of unfair to our artists that, that did it. Um, yeah. It was basically this uh, one guy, Ken and Tracy, did all the 3D art. And Ken, Ken does a lot of fantastic art for, for Star Trek fan films now. Um, and they, they were brilliant artists, but but the problem was that that I had slammed down a very strict polygon requirement on them, mm. and and the reasoning was that that uh, we were still kind of unfamiliar with the engine, so we didn't know how many monsters we could put on screen at once, but we knew that it wasn't going to be the hordes of monsters that you got with the Mind Magic six, seven, and eight. And so we said, well, we want to get as many as we can, so we're going to have to limit the polys. So that was why the monsters were ugly. It was more my fault <laughs> for saying, we want more monsters. I don't care that they're that ugly, rather than, than uh, let's make some really beautiful monsters and have, have fewer of them. all for this week's episode hope you guys enjoyed that should be back next week with the uh, final installment of this interview with mr tim lang and also i'll be interviewing a uh, uh, robert clardy uh, next week i'm going to do uh, the interview uh, at that time so if you have questions for him let me know uh, you can check out his uh, stuff on moby games he's got so many games a lot of the very early very very early uh, computer role-playing games uh, odyssey complete adventure I think there's one called Dungeon, uh, several other ones. He's also worked on, uh, I think he did the Dexter, uh, some levels on that at least. Not quite sure. We'll have to talk about, I'll have to ask him about that. Uh, also, uh, let's see, J.R. Tolkien's War in Middle Earth and uh, many, many other games. He's done like production, design, graphics, programming. He's kind of been all over the place. 
Uh, so anyway, go check out his Moby Games profile, and if you have questions for him, uh, just let me have those, and I will be happy to ask them. All right. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you very, very, very much, very, very much for your support of my show, keeping these interviews coming uh, with people like uh, Tim Lang and uh, Robert Clarity and uh, all these great folks. Uh, this wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you like this show, you like these episodes, want to see more, uh, please take a couple of minutes, go to that Patreon site, uh, sign up for an account. Remember, uh, one buck a show, what is that, about four bucks a month. <laughs> so, and you'll be uh, doing your part to keep these episodes coming. And uh, every, I really appreciate it, and I'm sure that your uh, uh, fellow CRPG fans will as well. So thank you very much for your support. All right, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, so uh, this is uh, <laughs> doesn't give you a lot of lead time, but uh, tomorrow at uh, 6 p.m. that's Central Time, I'll be doing the uh, Match at Google Air Hangout for May. Uh, so you can get the details for that. I'll put 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 a link there. But it's, uh, for Patreon supporters, any level, uh, you can come in and chat with me uh, during that hangout, uh, or you could just watch if you like. And I'll try to, you know, I've had some issues with the uh, software uh, lately about archiving it, but hopefully that'll be recorded. So if you do miss it, you'll be able to uh, watch it later. So anyway, I'll, keep, I'll tell you more about that next time, uh, or you can read about it on Facebook or and, and or Patreon. Uh, let's see. Uh, also, uh, really big, 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 big news. Uh, Chris Avalon has announced uh, a new CRPG project. This one is uh, based on the Pathfinder uh, game. It's called Pathfinder Kingmaker. And he's uh, teamed up with the company called Alcat Games. Uh, this will be an isometric party-based game set in the stolen lands of Pathfinder. Now, I have to admit, I'm not really familiar with uh, Pathfinder, but apparently, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, I was reading anyway, it's based on the uh, AD&D 3.5 rule set uh, with some tweaks and some improvements and some other uh, changes. Anyway, like I said, not really familiar with it. I've only heard good things about it, though. Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion both on uh, this project as well as what you think about Pathfinder. And then uh, finally, we've got a new Kickstarter up. Uh, this one's called Ash of Gods from a company called Aurum Dust. It's a turn-based RPG featuring a roguelike storytelling uh, storytelling system, I guess, uh, featuring risks that truly, in all caps, affect the gameplay uh, and an extensive online PvP mode. Uh, so anyway, it's a really interesting uh, trailer you can watch for this. Uh, you can see the art style here. It's kind of a, they describe it as a combination of classic Disney films as well as a Ralph Bakshi's stuff. Uh, of course, the Banner Saga uh, games came up. But anyway, this looks quite a bit different than a Banner Saga to me anyway. Anyway, go check it out. They're only asking for 75 uh, grand, already up to 14, and they just got started. So that's looking pretty promising. Uh, so anyway, go check out Ash of Gods and uh, support it <laughs> or let me know what you think. All right, I think that will do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I thought I would go for something special here. We have the uh, uh, Speedway Stout, Imperial Stout with Coffee. Uh, L. Smith Brewing Company um, out of uh, San Diego, California. So, <laughs> and this made it all the way from San Diego to St. Cloud, Minnesota. You could probably find this where you're from. I hope. Well, let's see. Alcohol, uh, 12%. Uh, it's a little bit on the high end, but uh, <laughs> actually, that's, I guess that's about twice the strength of a Budweiser. So uh, you probably want to be careful with this one and if you're going to be driving uh, anytime soon, right? Let's see. A Great American Beer Festival 2008 Small Brewing Company of the Year. Uh, Speedway Stout's ominous pitch black appearance has become a hallmark of this modern day classic. Chocolate roasted malts. Uh, notes of dark fruit toffee, healthy dose of locally roasted coffee. Uh, so it really does have coffee in here. Let's see. Speedway Stout's fine carbonation, blah, blah, blah. Beer ages very well and will continue to mature for many years to come. Uh, so they've got quite a bit here about the mouthfeel, etc., etc. <laughs> what to pair it with. Uh, well, <laughs> paired with the nutty cheeses like aged Gouda. 
and cloth bound cheddars. <laughs> You know, I think I, I don't think I've ever had a cloth bound cheddar uh, before. Uh, anyway, uh, serving a goblet. Well, we're going to be serving it in a drinking horn. Anyway, it looks really interesting. Uh, so, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of the Speedway Stout here in the rather excellent drinking horn. You know, I've got to say, it kind of pours out thick and black. <laughs> kind of like motor oil. I hope they didn't take this uh, Speedway metaphor too far. Uh, a little bit congested today, but I can definitely smell the uh, the chocolatey, uh, that really a chocolate, strong, strong chocolate aroma comes out of this. Almost like I was uh, uh, sniffing a little uh, vial of uh, Hershey's syrup. Is that what it uh, smells like? A little bit of a coffee aroma, but mainly it's the mainly that sort of chocolatey scent to it. Uh, anyway, let me give it a taste here. Well, this one, uh, it's really sweet, uh, but the sweetness, yeah, see, it's, it starts off really sweet, but then you get sort of that, that the sort of coffee flavor adds a little bit of a bitterness to this uh, that sort of balances out the sweetness. There's also quite a lot of uh, smoky flavors here. Actually, I would say, uh, you know, if I didn't know better, I might think I was drinking some bourbon. You know, it's a very, uh, sort of got that bourbon barrel uh, aged uh, flavor to it, although I don't think... Uh, this was bourbon barrel aged, but anyway, it's, it's what it uh, tastes like. Now, let me try it again here. Yeah, this one's a, you definitely taste the coffee. Uh, you taste the sort of chocolatey flavor. Uh, it's, it's not really hoppy. It's more a sort of bitter chocolate, a little bit of cherry flavor, uh, kind of almonds in there. You know, if this sounds like a pretty good combination of flavors, I think you'd like this. Uh, I know not everybody's crazy about these uh, coffee flavor brews. Uh, but I think it's a pretty good combination. I mean, I, I love coffee almost as much as I like <laughs> ale. Now, let me try it one more time. I mean, I really like this. Uh, again, I don't think it's for everybody. Uh, if you don't like coffee, of course, uh, stay away. If you don't like uh, strong uh, flavors or uh, sort of that sort of bourbon-y, uh, stout-like flavor, stay away. Uh, otherwise, though, I think you'd really, really enjoy this. I'm going to go actually go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's an imperial stout with coffee. Uh, it definitely delivers on that promise. Uh, if you like those things, I think you'll love this. So a full five out of five drinking horns on it. With the caveat, though, that if you don't like coffee, uh, stay away from it. All right, let's wrap up with a quotation then. And uh, I was looking for quotations about fantasy and mon fantasy monsters and beasts and so on and so forth. And I found this one by the Spanish artist Francisco Goya. And I just think this is a, you know, I really love this, this quotation. Uh, anyway, I'll share it with you. You can uh, let me know what you think about it. It goes something like this. Fantasy, abandoned by reason, produces impossible monsters. United with it, she is the mother of the arts and the origin of marvels. I just get goosebumps, right? <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys enjoy that and see you next week. about giving the guests what you think they want, and that's simple. Titillation, horror, elation, the politics. The guests don't return for the obvious things we do, the garish things. They come back because of the subtleties.